may not know. For those of you that may not know, um, stands for Leadership Management and Policy Interest Group of CASN. So we're very happy to have you here. We have wonderful speakers today who are building on Marianne Leary's presentation in May during Nurses Week on innovation and nursing leadership. They um, will be introducing themselves and the presentation is 22 minutes. So for those people that have limited amounts of time, you can listen to the presentation. And should you wish to stay for a question and answer and learn more, that's great. And if you're enabled, that's fine too. Just very, very quickly, I want to say that um, after the presentation, there will be an opportunity for question and answer. We would prefer that you use the chat for your questions and I can forward them on to Michelle and Caroline. Michelle and Caroline, excuse me. And uh, if you want to raise your hand, that's fine too. So with that, I will um, let Carolyn begin and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our presentation today called What If We Prepared Nursing Students for the Raw Edges of Nursing Life from the Very Beginning? A Question of Innovation and Primary Prevention. My name is Caroline Sabotig, and I was born and raised here in Thunder Bay, Ontario. I've had the privilege to live and learn on the lands of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. I am in my final year of the Master of Nursing Advanced Practice Specialization Program here at Lakehead University. My background in nursing is in critical care, and I'm currently the Simulation Lab Coordinator at Lakehead University. I now have the pleasure of inviting my co-presenter, Dr. Michelle Spadoni, to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Michelle Spadoni. I'm a daughter, sister, wife, and a new auntie, an associate nursing professor in the School of Nursing at Lakehead University. I teach year four nursing leadership and graduate courses in theory and philosophy. I am Métis. My father was French and Lakota. Both of his parents' families were part of the original Red River Land Settlement of Manitoba, 1869-1870. My mom's parents are first-generation immigrants from Ireland and France, and her parents had a farm on the Winnipeg River in an area they called Rat Portage, which is Kanoa region. From a truth and reconciliation perspective, it sits on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe people of Grand Council Treaty 3. My dad spoke French and Mishif, and why this is important, that's a Métis dialect common in Manitoba. His work took him all over the north, and indeed I was born up in northern Manitoba. But unlike my dad, I don't actually speak Mishif language. He thought if you were going to go to university, you should speak English. So when I think of myself, I think of myself as Métis but not as a Métis scholar. And that's a sort of a personal perspective. From my perspective, I'm, a, I'm not a Métis scholar because I don't hold the language. And the language holds the history, the culture, the traditions, and the teachings of the Métis people of Manitoba. I am grateful to live and be a guest on the lands of the people of Fort William First Nation, signatories of the Robertson Superior Treaty of 1850. So to begin our presentation today, I wish to start with mapping out a plan for our discussion. So we will start with our land acknowledgement, move into discussing relational inquiry as it's the foundation of our curriculum here at Lakehead University, and we'll scaffold today's presentation on that. We will look at its connection to design thinking, our conceptualization of design thinking in three phases. Uh, we'll work through those three phases, conceptualize the needs, and then finally we'll close with some potential strategies and next steps for curriculum changes and innovation. So when you look at this picture, I took these photos up on the mountain at Fort William First Nation. So Lakehead University School of Nursing is committed to a relationship with First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples based on the principles of mutual trust and collaboration in the spirit of reconciliation. With a recent conversation I had with an elder, and I was asked, we were talking about land acknowledgements. They noted if you come from a place of an open mind and an open heart, and you let go of what you think you know, and you let your mind and your heart connect, you will see the impacts of colonization and all living things. Noting that Indigenous people had their own knowledge systems, governance systems, 
uh, agreements between indigenous peoples and communities. And the elder noted that the first people of the land understood the fragility of the ecological world. They understood the tenuous relationship between commerce and government and governance and the powerful ways of understanding what is meant by being well and to live a, a balanced life in a good way. And that it's now our turn to learn to let go and to let our hearts and minds connect is our responsibility to learn in good ways in order to build good relations. So I think of this when I think about the truth and reconciliations call to actions in relation to my practice as a nurse and a teacher and as a researcher and as a wife and a daughter and sister and an aunt and a friend and a neighbor. So the picture in the middle here, if you look at the very lower level, you will see it illustrates the impact of colonial life through past to present day. The city of Thunder Bay was once a fur trading hub and it became a pulp and paper center and then it became a grain and shipping area. And the impact of such industries scars the land. It, left, it leaves its footprint on the land and the people. The expansion of the city literally extends now to the foot of the Fort William First Nation community. When we look at our school and the areas of Ontario that we um, work, the communities we work in and the places our students and families can come from, we actually are uh, the purple area, the Robertson Superior area, Treaty 5, Treaty 9 is what we call Anishinaabe Asking Nation. And it has 49 First Nation communities with a land mass of 210,000 square miles and an approximate population of about 45,000 Ojibwe, Cree, and Ojibwe people there living on the lands. The Grand Council Treaty, Treaty 3 represents 26 First Nation communities in Ontario and two in Manitoba and covers a land mass of about 55,000 square miles with a total population of about 25,000 Anishinaabe Ojibwe people. So in our land acknowledgement, we always say we respect, we pay respect to the elders past, present and future, for they hold the memories and the traditions and the culture and the hopes of Indigenous people. And we have chosen today just to look at four um, Indigenous scholars and knowledge holders that have been very important to us in the Faculty of Nursing. So on the left, we have May Cat. She was a BASC and graduate from Lakehead University. She transitioned into the role of an NP. She graduated from our school and May has an honorary doctorate of law from uh, Trent University for her work in the area of First Nation health. May works with Indigenous peoples and communities in practice and at the policy level. She's done projects with both the federal and provincial level of the Ministry of Health. As well, she's an expert witness sometimes uh, in relation to Indigenous people's experiences of intergenerational trauma as it relates to health and well-being. Elder Jerry Martin has military service and nursing service, and he works with our Native Nurses Entry Program, and he contributes in a thousand different ways to our nursing curriculum as, as it's transitioned over the years. Dr. Christopher Musquatch is a clinical psychologist within our health and behavioral sciences. And again, he's a CHR chair in Indigenous mental health and well-being and works in communities across the North. Jolie Madeline is, the, is one of the first Indigenous care coordinators at the Thunder Bay Regional Health Science Center, and she graduated from Lakehead University. So we can see the strength and the contributions of Indigenous knowledge keepers and scholars in our community, and we're grateful for their presence every day. Our curriculum is built on relational inquiries articulated by Gwyneth Dewan, Hartrick, and Colleen Varco. It sort of becomes important as we start to think about design thinking. Relational inquiry appreciates experiential knowledge. It's gained through practice. It, it appreciates context, how history, politics, social, economic structures shape nursing practice. And it, it engages with multiple ways of knowing required to address increasingly really complicated patient, family, and community needs, and the fast pace of knowledge turnover in all of our settings. So when we think about design thinking, uh, we, we sat down, we thought, well, it's human-centered, and it's rather iterative because we tried to work <laughs> through it. And we looked and, and we listened to Miriam Leary's discussion of design thinking, how, how she talked about what was what you need to know for 
the empathizing stage and the defining and the ideate and the prototypes and the testing phase. And she was going to add in equity. So we thought about that. And so for this presentation today, we're going to go through what we think about empathizing as listening, observing, our sharing of stories, our sharing of the research that we've looked at and our knowledge and uh, models and lenses that we're using. We're going to do some engaged imagining where we synthesize our experience with our research findings and we ask more questions. And then we're going to go into sort of a co-creating model where we're going to talk about really early innovation ideas around curriculum and uh, trauma-based care. And Caroline's going to sort of introduce us to some early ideas on prevention. Thanks, Michelle. So to apply design thinking to our work today, we will start, as Michelle said, working through the empathizing phase. So Michelle and I have had many conversations about challenges that we have faced personally in our own nursing practice, and also challenges that we've heard from our students that they've faced in their practice. I'll start with my story. So working at the bedside in critical care, I quickly became aware that as nurses, we are often exposed to traumatic and psychologically stressful events in practice, such as patient death. I recognized that there were limited resources and supports available to help nurses process and attend to the negative feelings and emotions that resulted from these traumatic experiences. I felt this weigh on myself personally and accumulate more over time and noticed the same in my colleagues around me. When I transitioned into my role as the simulation lab coordinator, I started working with our students in end of life and cardiac arrest type simulations um, where the simulated patient ultimately died. As I worked through the debrief phase of the simulation, the students would often share their experiences about a time in clinical when a patient had died. They said that it was really hard for them to experience this and even expressed feelings of uncertainty, unpreparedness, and often a sense of responsibility for what had happened. When I turned to the literature, I realized that this is a common reaction to the experience of patient death among nurses. This piqued my curiosity about how simulation-based learning and debriefing can be used in undergraduate nursing education to prepare students for the raw edges of nursing practice that they will face. It's not a matter of if they will experience psychological trauma, but more so when. So as I listen to Caroline, I'm reminded that there's a power in nurses' thoughtful and purposeful narratives of practice. Sociologist Arthur Frank suggests practitioners and patients alike tell stories in order to make sense of their experiences and to create meaning of difficult and or traumatic experiences so that others may learn from them. My experiences stem from conversations with graduate nurse, uh, nurses and, and students who are struggling to make sense of many traumatic moments of care over the lifespan of their nursing lives. They note that their many experiences have often led them to question whether they can remain in nursing. The environments in which they are practicing have them questioning their nursing identity at times, the purpose of their work, and their ability to provide good care. You have turned my attention, Caroline, to the impact on nurses from prolonged exposure to trauma and what graduate students have identified often in the same conversation as loss, loss of identity, control, voice, relationships, trust, hope, confidence, and belonging. Their conversations of loss in, in relation to trauma are woven with reflections around risk, safety, context, ethics and accountability. When I looked at the literature, nurse ethicists like Cinda Rushton and Christian Jones Bonifiglio discussed this trauma and this idea of loss in relation to things like moral injury, moral suffering, and moral distress. Indigenous scholars like Lisa Burrell Bearskin, through a relational ethics lens, explores trauma and loss in relation to racism and unsafe care. In the literature, there's a cumulative uh, experience of trauma in relation to loss it's frequently connected to this idea of loss of relationships, a loss of human life, or a loss of institutional integrity. Further loss in current literature informed, you know, in great part by the pandemic for sure, is shaped by things like legislative changes that occurred externally often to hospitals and to nurses outside structures making decisions about what was happening at the bedside that extended RN and RPN scope of practice. 
drawing our attention to the ways in which structures like the formal and informal practices and policies and procedures in our workspaces shape our work in visible and invisible ways, but have real outcomes that are very tangible in the lives of nurses and patients. Things like shortage of staff further normalized high patient nurse ratios and rationalized the need to increase in some areas of our province unregulated health providers to deliver care at the bedside across institutional settings. Researchers have talked about um, it also provided the rationale for cancellation of vacation days related to a state of emergency because there's not enough staff and the impact on nurses' lives. But nursing shortage in itself is not rare. We have talked for years about the ideologies of scarcity. But what's happening that's new in the literature of late is the impact of misinformation and disinformation has accelerated and led to distrust of nurses by the broader population. As well, it, researchers are saying there was institutional silencing where nurses were contractually told that they could not discuss uh, issues outside the boundaries of the hospital or the institution itself, and sometimes even within the institution. So Asinda Rushton uh, said, like, so how are they, where are they able to talk about trauma and the accumulated effect of that in their lives as nurses? Uh, researchers have also indicated that the repeated exposure to traumatic clinical events increases practitioners' experience of protracted grief presentism, absenteeism, increased sick time, organizational attrition, and nurses leaving the profession. Ultimately, as one noted, nurses feel responsible. It's all on their backs, and those backs are breaking. They're breaking mentally, and they're breaking physically. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing your stories and some discussions that you've had with your graduate students, as well as pertinent literature on loss. As we now move into the engaged imagining phase, I will share some examples from my focused literature, literature reviews that look at nurses in practice that experience psychological trauma. I will start with RNs in practice, work my way back to new grads during their transition to practice phase, and then finally look at nursing students in undergraduate education. Just to preface uh, the use of the term psychological trauma today, I'm using it as an all-encompassing term for the various forms of psychological trauma that we see in the literature. So that could be burnout, moral distress, compassion, fatigue, vicarious trauma, just to name a few. There is extensive literature about registered nurses in practice who experience traumatic clinical events, such as patient death or deterioration, and this has been found to be a psychologically stressful event for nurses. This psychological stress, if left unattended, has been found to cause feelings of inadequacy, unpreparedness, and helplessness, and that can lead to the formation of psychological trauma in various forms. This can impact the quality and safety of patient care delivery and push nurses to leave the already critically short profession. The same challenges also exist among our new graduate population, but have an even more profound effect on this group as they are so fragile during the transition to practice phase. Now, when considering how death affects our nursing student population, I suspect that many individuals in the audience today can recall a conversation that they've had with a student who's expressed negative feelings and emotions about a patient death in clinical. There is currently much less literature around nursing students and their experience of patient death during their time in the program. But I think that this really highlights the importance of thinking about how we can better prepare students in undergraduate education early on for the psychologically stressful events that they will experience to prepare a more resilient future of nurses. So to conceptualize the need, Michelle and I had many conversations, reviewed the literature, and further discussed these challenges with colleagues and students, and that helped us to identify our need statement. Practicing nurses and nursing students are struggling to attend to the emotions and feelings that are elicited from traumatic clinical events in the complex practice environments that we work in today. We then returned to the literature to have a closer look at some potential innovations and found that some researchers are starting to look at psychological capital. I'll discuss this more on the next slide. I came across this first in literature around nursing leadership, but it resonated really well with my findings around traumatic events in nursing practice. 
Based on that, Michelle and I have further conceptualized the need for curriculum changes and innovations that support building psychological capital as a means to prepare students to navigate the traumatic events in practice. So the concept of psychological capital was developed by Fred Leffens and his team in 2007. Psychological capital refers to an individual's positive psychology and how they can use that as a resource to navigate challenges. It differs from other constructs in positive psychology as psychological capital is state-like, meaning it can be developed, which is really important uh, for the discussion and work that we're having here today. The four interwoven components of psychological capital are hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism, and they're often referred to in the literature as hero. So hope is having the willingness to pursue success despite challenges that arise. Efficacy is self-confidence about one's role. Resilience is the ability to positively cope and adapt when faced with adversity. And optimism is having a positive outlook toward the future. There have been studies completed that demonstrate um, that the relationship between new nurse turnover and psychological capital um, so higher psychological capital is in fact protective against the development of psychological trauma. We can assess psychological capital using a 24 point Likert type scale called the psychological capital questionnaire or PCQ for short. So now that Michelle and I have reviewed the literature and discussed some stories, we will transition into the co-creating phase of our design thinking. We have some potential strategies and curriculum changes to share. Our goal is that through implementing these strategies early on in undergraduate education, we can employ a primary prevention approach that will help students to build a toolkit of resources that will help them to feel more prepared to work through the challenging clinical events that they will face in practice. So first we consider the addition of a trauma-informed debriefing and simulation-based learning. A trauma-informed psychologically safe debrief, also known as TIPS debriefing, was recently developed by Dr. Nicole Harder and her team in 2021. The goal of this was to shift the focus from traditional uh, simula simulation-based learning debriefing that focuses more on those clinical skills and assessments to a trauma-informed approach that addresses the feelings and emotions that nurses experience as a result of the traumatic event. Next, we consider the implementation of trauma-informed debriefing for students in the clinical setting. So at the current time, this may or may not be happening depending on the level of comfort that the clinical instructor has with debriefing death. To help clinical instructors feel adequately prepared to debrief death and other traumatic experiences, we would certainly need to offer them an educational session on how to debrief as well as the debriefing framework that we select. We would also like to create a feedback loop between the students and instructors and clinical faculty to monitor the effectiveness of this intervention. Next, we would like to consider concepts that we can embed into our theory courses to start attending to the need to prepare students for the realities of practice early. So first, we would like to develop psychological capital in our students, but I mean, it's, of course, important to consider how can we develop this if we don't, if the students don't even know what their baseline is. So we think that it would be important to have the students perform the psychological capital questionnaire, PCQ, as a self-assessment each year of the program to develop that baseline. And then as they travel through the program um, and have different traumatic experiences, it may have changed their psychological capital level, and we can consider ways that we can support them through those changes. I'll pass it back to Michelle for the last point. So as we were doing this work, we both thought, you know, <clears throat> there was, there's a lot more to learn around design thinking for health, but I can see it as a potential for year four with a nursing leadership course to introduce students to these ideas. And at the graduate level, particularly often when I'm in a hospital and I'm listening to nurses try to explain why something's not working, you'll hear this, you're having an emotional response. You're not seeing the bigger picture. And I think sometimes what can we do to provide our nurses with lenses in which to think about and articulate the concerns that they're seeing and use the evidence that's generated in their units and the literature to support them so that when they go to management and say, this policy results like this, and this is what we've noted, 
that they're no longer left and that you're having an emotional response or you're not seeing the bigger picture. So it just opened a lot of thinking on our part. So that's, um, yes, that's, I guess, our 22 minutes. You're going to close it off, Caroline. Thanks. So as we close today's presentation, we would like to leave you all with some next steps. So first, we, of course, need to take a deeper dive into the literature around psychological capital. And within that realm, there's a really interesting concept called academic buoyancy that we can look at as well. In terms of curriculum review, we can see where traumatic care moments or simulation based learning might fit into each year of the program to help expose students to these challenging um, events in the safe space of simulation. We'd also like to start formal tracking of the PCQ at each year level. And of course this needs to be done anonymously. And then based on the, this tracking and uh, the findings, we can then see the highest risk areas for students and inform further curriculum changes based on that. Thank you all for attending our presentation today. And we would love to open the floor for questions and discussion. Thank you very much. That was really wonderful. You made me think about this in a new way. Excellent, excellent. So questions um, from the audience. If you could do um, put your question in the chat, or if you like, you can um, just raise your hand and then I'll call upon you to make sure we have some order to the, uh, to the questions. That was just terrific. Thank you. And if I'm not seeing any hands go up, let me know. It was a lot of really good information. And you're right, I have heard that too, an emotional response to a situation. But there is definitely more to it. And I have come to see that through my own research. And some of the nurses or um, some of the front frontline managers that I interviewed were traumatized by COVID-19 and what they saw as well. So that makes me think about a lot of things. Yeah. Okay, there's a question or a thought. Oh, sorry, I missed the presentation piece. Will this recording be shared for later viewing? Yes, it is being recorded and it will be on the Kazan YouTube page. Is that correct, Saida? Yes, on Kazan's YouTube page. I'll also email everybody with the recorded link. Oh. Okay, that's great. Yeah, Sonia, I often think that we need to be looking at the work of um, groups like the work that you and Moira are doing from a leadership perspective, particularly with our grad students. I think they need to have ways of talking about this. And I think that sometimes we think of things as research, but they can also be a lens in which um, graduate nurses in leading roles and even our undergrads are in leadership roles these days when you think about it because sometimes they are the only person that the patient ever sees but we need right. to be able to give them tools in which to voice these concerns and and not be told that they're being emotional you know you, know, you make a very good point this um this past winter was the first time that i've taught in person for for a while and I was teaching to the graduate students uh, in our program at the University of Manitoba. And initially, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of laughter about some of the issues and, you know, challenges, trauma they faced. I didn't quite understand it at the time, even though I've been immersed in this research. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to stay focused on the literature and on the concepts that we were talking about. But many of them had a lot of trauma after what they experienced, but I didn't quite understand it in the way that perhaps the way uh, I didn't fully understand it until I was completely done the course. But, you know, you make a very good point. What kinds of tools and strategies do they have to be able to be um, to have psychological capital and be able to, you know, continue managing their their work and but will continue to be a rather uncertain environment. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from anybody? Feel welcome to raise your hand. I, I think it's given people a lot to think about actually. Yeah, yeah I think it has. It's uh, making us think a little differently. It's part of innovation and teaching. Mm -hmm.
perhaps okay. Priya, please. Hi there. Good Go morning. Ahead. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your presentation. I, as I was listening to it, something that a term that stuck out for me um, was institutional silencing. And it really just got me thinking about how we stress the importance of um, confidentiality and, uh, and maintaining confidentiality in our practice. But I wholeheartedly agree that students and young nurses and nurses of all experience levels experience psychological trauma in their practice and trying to find a healthy outlet for them to discuss and share and work through this trauma. So I'm really, um, I, I can't wait to see where this psychological um, questionnaire, like how it comes into play in uh, changing curriculum and also just making students aware that this is something that they're going to experience, how we can find a healthy outlet for them to discuss what they're experiencing, but in a manner that maintains confidentiality and doesn't uh, impact any contractual um, rules and regulations around, um, around what they're experiencing and being able to share that. Yeah. So thank you for bringing this up essentially. Yeah, because there is so much it packed in there, right? Is it safe for people to talk sometimes? We often tell our students that, you know, to, how do you know it's safe to say something? Even when you're working with a preceptor, is it safe? And even in, um, there's such risk of, of putting themselves out there when they speak of these things. So I found it interesting. No one had really good answers in the literature. I've been digging to see what they're saying about that. Like, where are where are safe spaces? How do you know that the person you're talking with, it, it will be safe? Like if you're talking to a manager, will it be perceived in the wrong way? All of those things are coming up in the literature. That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. We have another question on chat. So the question is, how could we navigate or encourage students opening up in group settings about any trauma they experience uh, in front of their peers, or should this be done one-to-one -one instructor and student? In my experience, students usually come to me post-debrief, after lab, sim, and after or after clinical to have these discussions. I understand that a large part of it would be due to the learning environment the instructor creates, but what else could we do to um, help the student work through the trauma they experienced? Thanks, I can answer that question. So what's coming to mind um, right away is of course setting the stage with pre-briefing and simulation. So um, the trauma-informed debriefing framework looks at uh, pre-briefing and important components to establish psychological safety, uh, which is definitely key. But I agree that even in my experience and same, same thing, oftentimes students, some students will feel comfortable to share it uh, in that sim space, but sometimes they do come to me after. I think that this is where it's really nice to see that clinical instructor debrief in the clinical setting in their clinical group. Because likely, if one student has been exposed to a patient who has passed away, more than one of the students in that group have also been a part of it to some extent, maybe not as the primary student nurse, but to some extent. So I think that that could be a nice way to um, really establish the importance of peer support and debriefing in the group in the setting at the time, similar to how you would in practice with a group um, like in the ICU after your patient codes maybe debrief as, as a team. So I think that those are um, ways that we can consider that, but I agree it is challenging to navigate that. Great, very good. Michelle. And I think we're thinking too, we have times when lately when our students and our clinical instructors will say that when they were in the clinical setting, somebody lost their cool and there was an outburst, an emotional outburst by a practitioner, whether it be a nurse, a physician or whatever that situation is. And they and and it made them freeze. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. They didn't. Know, so they just, you know, they disappear into all the utility rooms and everywhere else. But the clinical instructors have said, you know, there has to be a way maybe for us to talk about that. And I'm thinking that working with them, Caroline, as we 
see what this will look like might be useful because they are also seeing that sort of tra trauma um, in, in the practice setting right now. Uncontrolled outbursts, different things that are, yeah. Thank you. Marianne has a question. Please go ahead, Marianne. Thank you very much. Um, I've really enjoyed this presentation. My focus, my keen interest is on supporting um, clinical instructors. So I'm responsible at U of T to design and facilitate um, the CI orientations. And there's so much to include. There's so little time. Um, but this is something I think is really important. And I'm wondering if you've thought, I have two questions. I'm wondering what you currently might do to help prepare um, CIs to debrief these sorts of traumas, like in a clinical post-conference, um, because I agree, they do need some training. We can't assume that they know what to do. And I find if CIs are unsure of if they're gonna do the right thing, they tend to not do it. Um, have you considered maybe developing a simulation for CIs as part of their training or preparation for the role where you have some of them with student role cards coming with a traumatic event and then the CI would have to, you could do peg, peg team or pausing to sort of have them um, think about how they might respond and facilitate that discussion. And if you're gonna do anything like that, or if you have done that, the CI interest group with Kazan would be really interested in collaborating. That's a fabulous idea. I hadn't thought of that yet. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's really interesting. And definitely I, I'll put more thought to that. I think what I've considered so far in terms of prepping our clinical instructors would be a one or one and a half hour um, webinar type thing, just looking at like the fundamentals of debrief, uh, the key components. We would, like I said, have to definitely find the appropriate clinical debriefing framework because the literature does demonstrate that clinical debrief does focus on more like the emotional response and attending to that uh, compared to simulation-based uh, debrief. So finding the right framework that fits well with our learners and our clinical instructors that's simple enough for them um, to pick up and follow when the time comes, I think would be important. Another um, idea that I've considered is just putting together a local resource group. So within our university, uh, within Thunder Bay, for all of our students who are in the clinical setting in Thunder Bay, so that when they leave, um, maybe they haven't realized that it's affected them to, you know, it really affected them in the moment, but then they go home and they're thinking about it. So just that, so that they have a resource list of how to take next steps and get that help. Um, that's kind of the start of my, my thinking on that. Michelle, do you have anything to add? I think in some ways it is occurring here and there. We have, um, like some of our clinical instructors, extremely experienced and I, funny enough, we see it in long-term care. We've had a few extremely experienced long-term care leads who have been nurse managers, chief nursing officers, and they have been sort of working their way through informal practices with debriefs because, um, and one of them said, she said, it's often a shock to walk into long-term care. And so she said, my life has been spent working in that area. And she said, I don't want the students to leave without understanding what all is happening and the uh, important impact that nurses can have and the important impact of personal support workers and families. So she takes, every, I asked her once, she said, every opportunity, she said, when I see students stunned about something, upset about something, she said, I have a, a system that I work through like I would with new staff. So even they're doing it informally. So we, we need to do, Caroline was on to something when she said, we need to do some work here because we do have some, so some students are receiving that and others are not because you have so many clinical instructors. Yeah. So we're like, we know what's happening mm -hmm. informally. Mm -hmm. 
So but you've got, be, yeah, you've got me thinking that I need to tap into, well, we all need to tap, if we work with CIs, tap into their expertise um, and have them part of building this e-module or learning resource um, yeah. to guide others. Um, so yeah. I may just stay in touch with you guys to see what, what comes of this, because I think it's a really, really important um, aspect of clinical education from a student perspective anyway, so thank you. Thank you. And just one more thing to add to that would be perhaps even having the clinical instructors perform the psychological capital questionnaire, see where they're currently at. I mean, they may have years of unresolved trauma, right? So um, taking it that one step further could be helpful uh, in just improving their awareness. We also have a question in the chat. How can yes. students be supported to speak up without fear of implicit bias from their instructor that could affect their final grade? And this is significant. This, um, I've coordinated in the upper years at different times beyond, because we've just had a need for whatever reason. This is a huge piece. What do you think, Caroline? Yeah, I think that that's definitely challenging. I think that more specifically in the clinical setting, that clinical instructor is um, in between the student and the course faculty. So that's definitely, I think, a good place to start. I think we'd have to put some more thought to this as well. I hadn't thought of it in that sense. But I think embracing authentic leadership and understanding that we do need to um, we need to display to our students and our clinical instructors what we want. So we want them to be self-reflective and understanding that maybe something has affected them so that they can attend to it um, at the right time instead of letting it go too far. So yeah, good question though. Good Sometimes um, when I've worked with fourth year clinical courses, I have sat with my clinical leads and some of the preceptor groups and I've, I've talked to the students about this, that they're in a transitioning phase and that their practice, they will have times when they don't have all the pieces and where a preceptor is going to have to step in and say, I need you to do this because you've missed this. And to get them through that moment and to get the patient to a safe space and to get the student to a safe space. And so the, our dialogue and our narrative, I tried to shift that to this was a learning moment for all of us. And the patient is safe. And you moved your moved through it with this preceptor who has years of knowledge in this area. So how can we support you to get to that point where you can walk along with your patient to that safe space? with just a little assistance from your preceptor. How can we get you there? And then bringing them in, we have like Caroline with Sim, we have another uh, Jessica, and sometimes I've sent students to you and you work through events in the Sim lab. At first, some of them are really resistive. I have to say that, but, but after it's funny, they'll come back to me and they'll say, you know, they worked in ICU. They did this, they did that. They showed, They gave me a whole bunch of different ways of thinking because we didn't come to that space as a disciplinary matter, but more as a, this is an opportunity. And I know in your heart, you would never want to put a patient in jeopardy. So if we can, you know, put you with these practitioners who work in our sim and they've got all this experience, you can find a way of getting there. But it takes a lot of change in our narrative around this. And, and unfortunately, sometimes our students have had experiences where they have, received negative feedback for, for an event that they've been in to the point that they that they just don't want to deal with anything when somebody says they have a practice issue. I, we have had students who've been misinterpreted, have had difficult times right from year one. And they, they carry that. And of course, that becomes their lens. And that's a lens of trauma in some ways. It's a lens of all this experience coming at them. It's and I think we're going to have to work with that. Um, it's a constant thing. I don't know, Caroline. Yeah, I, I agree. Very well said. Yeah. <clears throat> great, great discussion. There aren't any more questions in the chat. Um, anybody else in the group would like to perhaps 
speak to our uh, presenters or make a point, you're definitely welcome. So maybe if nobody's uh, raising their hand, I will just uh, share a few things before we sign off. So if there is an opportunity for any of you who are interested to join LMP, please, we would welcome your participation. There are about four meetings a year. We're done for this year. Uh, it's $50 and there is a discount in January if you join where it's $25. Our third educational presentation will be in September, and it will also be connected to, to innovation. It will be probably in late September or early fall. Uh, Dr. Sue Bookie Bassett and Peter Newman from Toronto Metropolitan University will be speaking about uh, engineering modeling approaches to measuring nurses' workload. So if any of you are interested, keep that in mind. We'll keep you posted. There is one more message. Oh, the reg registration for interest groups starts in, ju in July. So on that note, I want to thank you, Michelle and Caroline. You were uh, really wonderful. We learned so much from you, and I really learned a lot as well. And um, yes, it is $25 in joining, if joining in January. Right, Saida? Yes. Okay, um, so thank you both for, for coming. We've learned a lot and uh, have a great day, everybody, and uh, see you in the fall. <laughs>